Luke's Gospel, chapter 23, verse 34. Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And departed his raiment and cast lots. Do you see that? That's what he said in verse 34. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Then the New Century Version Jesus says, Father, forgive them because they don't know what they are doing. Soldiers threw lots to decide who would get his clothes. But the emphasis is on, in your Bible, what's read. Father, forgive them because they do not know what they are doing. The grass will wither, the flowers will fade. The word of our Lord, it will last forever. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Here is the question, who killed Jesus? Who killed Jesus? It's a valid question, who killed Jesus? In fact, we know that somebody is guilty of murder because he died a brutal death on the cross. You remember, it was Friday, somebody shall Friday. The ninth hour, which means it was about 3 o'clock in the afternoon when he took his last breath. In fact, Luke 23 and verse 46 says, And when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And having said thus, he gave up the ghost. And so the question is, who killed Jesus? Who caused his violent death? It's it's obvious that it was more than one person because Jesus says, while he is hanging from the cross, Father, forgive them. The word them, the word them, is a pronoun. It, it refers to two or more people. The things previously mentioned are easily identified. But there's another question. The second question is why is it important for us to know who killed? Jesus because when we identify the people who are responsible for killing him we'll understand why he is asking God to forgive them come on let's let's get to the scripture because when we consider the perpetrators who could possibly be responsible for his death scripture says that Jesus is victimized by at least three groups of people the first is the crowd Matthew's Gospel, chapter 27, verses 22 through 23, you'll remember Pilate asks the question, what shall I do then with Jesus who's called the Messiah? And they all answered, this is what they said, crucify him. And Pilate asks again, why, what, what crime has he committed? But, but they shouted all the louder, crucify him. So the first perpetrator is the crowd. Secondly, the Jewish officials, Matthew's gospel, chapter 26 and verse 59. Now the chief priests and elders and all the council sought false witness against Jesus. Watch this, to put him to death. And finally, the third group, the soldiers, John 19, verses 19 and 23. Then he delivered him therefore unto them to be crucified. And they took Jesus and led him away. And then you read verse 23. Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts to every soldier a part and also his coat. And so the question again, who killed Jesus? Is there anybody else other than these three who could be responsible for his death? We're going to have to walk through this text to discover who, 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 who the people are who are responsible for putting him on the cross. But now, while we are working to unravel all of the responsible parties, I do want you to see that Jesus is praying for their forgiveness. Don't miss that. He is interceding on their behalf to his father that God does not enact justice or wrath against them for putting him on the cross. But greater, somebody shall greater. It is worth noting that Jesus is asking God 
to forgive those who are responsible for his death and yet their actions against him, their cruelty towards him, watch this, is the result of prophecy. Y'all ain't hearing me. The actions against Jesus was prophesied. I told you I'm going to preach Jesus. I don't know if you're going to wait on something else, but I'm just preaching Jesus. Uh, their actions against Jesus were prophesied, Sherry, in Old Testament scripture. Isaiah 53 and 5, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we healed. Isaiah 53 and 12, for this reason I will make him a great man among people and he will share in all things with those who are strong. He willingly gave his life and was treated like a criminal, but he carried away the sins of many people and asked forgiveness for those who sinned. Psalms 22, 16 and 17, evil people have surrounded me like dogs. They have trapped me. They have bitten my arms and legs. I count all my bones. People look and stare at me. They divide my clothes among them and they throw lots for my clothing. This is prophetic scripture. So the crucifixion event is foretold in Old Testament scripture and, and it's, it, it, it gets us from the point of Jesus being flogged where he is beaten, to his torture on the cross, nails and, and the cutting open of his sides, the offering even of gall vinegar to sedate him so he won't be able to feel the pain of his wounds, even to the parting of his clothes and the soldiers casting lots and gambling at the foot of the cross for his garments. But the question is, somebody shout the question is, if Jesus is supposed to die, and if the manner of his death was foretold in Old Testament scripture, and finally, if Calvary and the crucifixion happened as it was supposed to, then why is Jesus praying for their forgiveness? Y'all ain't helping me preach. Well, I want you to see the message that comes through the suffering and death of Jesus. Number one, number one, Jesus is functioning in his messianic role. He says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. The, the truth is, he, he came to save us. Somebody shout, he came to save us. That's, that's, what we, that's what we say at Christmas. Matthew 1, 21, she shall bring forth a son. Thou shalt call his name Jesus. For he shall save his people from their sins. We get all caught up in that babe, wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. It is, it is a foreshadowing of, 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 of dyed garments and what he will be laid in in the tomb. Have I got any help in here? But God sent him to save us. And a part of the salvation process is forgiveness. I need you to see the full circumference of, of forgiveness. Because this shows us that Christ's plea for forgiveness suggests the length of God's reach and work to redeem humanity. There is absolutely, positively, no excuse for anybody who goes to hell. There is no excuse for anybody who does not make it to heaven because the crucifixion event shows us, proves to us that God's nature is to forgive. If you go to hell, it's because you wanted to go. Because God has a forgiving nature. That thing will make you shout if you think about it. The whole fact of my salvation is because God is a forgiving God. He looks beyond my faults. And I wonder, is there anybody in this house who will praise him because he's a forgiving God? I don't know your story. I don't know where you come from. But the basis of your salvation is he forgave you. Now, your neighbor and say, that's why I love him like I do. I'm walking in forgiveness. Not only that, Jesus is functioning in his role as intercessor. Father, <laughs> forgive them. Well, they don't know what they're doing. He is our, our intercessor. He stands in the gap between God and humanity and then works to tie them back together. He brings us to the place of forgiveness and then ushers us into the presence of the Lord through blood redeemed and then hands us to God no longer as enemies or strangers, but as sons and daughters of the Most High God. 
and you can't shout about that. That to God, Reggie, you used to be his enemy, but you've been washed in the blood of the lamb. And now when God sees you, he doesn't see who you used to be. He sees who you are right now. That you are blood bought and redeemed, washed from all of your iniquity. Nudge your neighbor and say, I've been made brand new. Because if any man be in, come on, he is a new what? Old things. Come on, help me preach it. Past old things have become what? That's why you shout like you do. You're not the person you used to be. You're the person who's been made brand new. I'm just preaching about Jesus. Is there anybody in here? Your testimony is that he made you brand new. Give him praise right there. Jesus. Not only functioning in his messianic role, not only functioning in his role as intercessor, but he is functioning in his role as humanity's sacrifice. Are you still in here? See Luke 23 and 33. And when they came to the place which is called Calvary, they crucified him. Are you here? The Old Testament requirement for atonement is a sacrifice. Are y'all hearing me? I, I want you to catch this. Old Testament scripture tells, tells us if we're going to have a sacrifice, we got to have a lamb that's perfect. He cannot have spot. He cannot have, have blemish. If, if he is going to, to be the chosen sacrifice for the sins of a family, then he's got to be perfect. And when we consider the crucifixion, it's not just his death on the cross, or rather, it's not just his, his death on the cross, but the brutality of his suffering before he is finally crucified. I don't want you to think that Calvary was easy. I don't want you to think that he didn't go through anything on your behalf. He was spit on, blindfolded, slapped and slugged by members of the Jewish Sanhedrin. Then, then the gods took him and beat him. He was whipped. He received 39 lashes with a whip that had metal spikes on the ends that ripped his flesh and opened his back to the visibility of his tendons and muscle. The, the beatings endured, they, 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 that he endured, weakened his body and put him in a state of shock. He had five major wounds and spike wounds in his wrists and feet. And he was fi five wounds in his in, 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 his, in his hands and feet and then his upper torso was cut open with a Roman spear and yet he endured it because the salvation of humanity requires a sacrifice. God sent him to suffer and die. John 3.16 really gives us the explanation because it says that God's gift to the world is Jesus and that the world would be saved through his sacrifice. Hebrews 9 and 22 settles it for me. Because what happens in the New Testament is sitting on the foundation of the Old Testament. And when I hear Hebrews 9 and 22, indeed under the law almost everything is purified by blood. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. I wish I had a witness here. You don't know how you got here. And it is the reason why some of us, Vera, handle Jesus very casually because we don't understand what he endured to save us. He didn't just lay down on the cross. He was beaten before he got there. Y'all ain't helping me preach. And there is no one in humanity's history who could have handled what he handled because he was sinless and perfect. He was the lamb who died for the family. Heaven got any help in here. But I want you to shout when you hear, you won't need another lamb. <laughs> Touch your neighbor and say, we won't need another one. Because the death he died, he died one time. I wish I had a witness here. I said the death he died, he died one time. And now that he is dying, because you will read in scripture, Brother Sprags, while well, the veil in the temple was rent in two which means we don't need another high priest. 
He has cleared the access way to God and put us in a position where we don't need anybody to walk in and make intercession for us. A, a, a position of atonement. No, no, no. He has done that for us on the cross and now when we want to go to God because we are his sons and daughters, we can just call him our father and he will respond to us. Do got to mess around and got happy. Somebody in here ought to shout about the fact that you have an open path to God. That you don't need anybody to ring God and say it's you. Because you are his son and his daughter. You can walk into the presence of God and tell him what you want. Even Jesus said you can ask what you will. And it shall be done. How? Because I have access to the Father. Have I got any help in here? You ought to nudge somebody and say, I'm God's child. I'm, I'm God's child. Y'all ain't hearing me. I'm, I'm God, I got privilege. I'm, I'm God's child. I've got access. I'm God's child. I don't need anybody to make the way for me. I'm, I'm God's child. And, and because I am who I am, I can tell him what I want. He answers me. He talks to me. Old Testament, he talked to the high priest, but now because of Jesus, he talks to me. Anybody ever had God just talk to you? Give God praise right there. He's functioning in his role. As humanity's sacrifice. But wait a minute, what, what, what lessons then do we extract from the image of Jesus on the cross? Father, forgive them. I'm just preaching Jesus. They know not what they do. Father, forgive them. They have no idea what they're doing. The first lesson we extract from this is, is freedom always requires sacrifice. Freedom. Always requires sacrifice. Matthew's gospel 16 and 24 says, if any man come after me, let him deny himself. You know, it's, it's interesting. In our personal lives, we don't, we don't really get to the place of righteousness, which is what I like to term spiritual freedom or right standing with God without the surrender of something. <laughs> for Jesus it cost him his life for us it might not cost our physical lives that might not be the requirement but to be Christ like to, to walk at a higher level of spiritual maturity it will always require that we place something on the cross y'all ain't helping me preach now, now I, I, I want you to hear it the, 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 the suffering of Jesus is horrendous. I mean, when we talk about how he is mistreated and he's whipped and abused, but, but our redemption, our freedom comes through what he took to the cross. Are y'all hearing me? J Jesus took the sinfulness of humanity to the cross and then died on it to release us from the dead. And so now, in that manner, the cross is still in place. Lord, have mercy. Because the cross has become our altar. And when we, when we endeavor to get to a higher place of spiritual maturity, we see that cross as the place to unburden ourselves of anything that stands in the way of our maintaining our righteousness, our right standing with God. The cross is the altar. And he has opened the way so that when we discover the baggage of sin in our life, we can make our way to Calvary and deposit it on the cross. Because you'll never get to a place of righteousness or right standing without surrendering something. Have I got any help in here? You got to put some stuff on the cross. If you tell me you're perfect, I'm going to have to take issue with you. Because the Bible says there's only one that's perfect. Come on, somebody. Even on your best day, you ain't perfect. And I ain't trying to get you to tell on yourself, but there's somebody in here that's had to make a trip to Calvary. Put your attitude on the cross and 
put your mouth on the cross. You've even had to put some folk on the cross. Some habits on the cross. Because if you desire to get to a higher spiritual level, you can't just ascend there. Because what takes you higher is the release of some stuff. Not your neighbor and say, I've had to let some stuff go <laughs> to go higher in the law. Don't, don't tell nobody what you had to let go of because it might mess them up. But you know, you know where you've come from. You know what you've been through. You know your mess. You know your proclivities. You know the stuff that turns you on. You know the stuff that gets in your way. And you know when you're growing that, that you can take your own self to the cross. Take your burdens to the Lord and leave them there. You know you're growing when you can take your own self to the cross and put your stuff on the cross. I'm preaching. I wonder are you hearing me? Anybody had to put some stuff there? And then just go and tell the truth. It, it ain't other folks. You just laid on the cross because you got so much you dealing with. You can't just take it off. You just lay down. Lord, Lord, deal with me. Lord, get me together. Lord, help my mind. Lord, help me to act right. Lord, get me in the right position. Lord, get me where I'm supposed to be. There are times when you just lay on the cross. You need that process of the osmosis where righteousness flows from him to you. You just lay down on the cross. I'm not preaching about an emblem. I'm preaching about the bloodstained cross. Because this, this emblem is cute. It's pretty. It's bedazzled with rubies, but it ain't saved nobody. But there is a wooden cross. There is a bloodstained, my God. There is a bloodstained cross that stands for our redemption. Nudge your neighbor and say, get to the cross. Get to the cross. No, 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 no. Tell him, get to the cross. Get to the cross. I am heard you yet. Look at your neighbor and say, get to the cross. Tell him, unburden yourself. Get to the cross. Tell him, get beyond all the stuff you messed up on. Get to the cross. Tell him, get to a higher level by getting to the cross. And when you get there, don't just stand there and look at it. Put something on it. Have I got any help in here? I gotta hurry up, I gotta hurry up. Well, what lessons? What lessons do we extract from Jesus on the cross? Just what we come away with is that our, our lives have to be connected to a larger circumference than ourselves. Our lives have to be connected to a larger circumference than ourselves. Because the goal, Marla, is to be Christ-like. Come on, y'all. If you read Luke 23, he demonstrates that his life has been given to a larger purpose. The unfortunate thing is that in 21st century culture, the church sometimes becomes self-centered and self-consumed. But if we're going to be like him, we have to see ourselves given in ministry, given in service, given in outreach, given in discipleship, because John 3.16 shows us the larger circumference when, when, when Jesus says, for God so loved the world, the Greek is cosmos. He's not really dealing with a ball of earth no 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 he's dealing with he's dealing with people the, the whole idea of john three sixteen is that god gave jesus to humanity Ooh. one writer says courtney he reaches into himself and pulls out himself and then hands himself to the people who are made in his image and in his likeness he does it because he loves us it's the larger circumference that he is always concerned with. And the church cannot be self-consumed. We were made to be given. We were saved to be given. And when we only think about the local assembly and ourselves, we are living beneath our purpose. The whole idea of him dying on the cross is God handing him over. One writer talks about the grief of God's gift. 
how in the giving of Jesus, it grieves the heart of God to know what he will go through to save humanity. And even with all that he knows, he still gives him. Come on, y'all. I don't even know how, how much you are fully aware of, Dr. Linda, of the crucifixion event. She and I have had these discussions that when Jesus dies on the cross, when he, when he utters, Jaleesa, his last word, the, the, the world eclipses and turns black. The lights go out on planet Earth. Y'all ain't helping me preach. And the God who gave Jesus is the God who turns around because he can't handle the sight of his son hanging on the cross. Have I got any help in here? I mean, he turns his back. It is, it is even in scripture, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. Why hast thou forsaken me? Jesus is saying, don't turn yet. I ain't dead yet. Don't turn yet. I need you in this moment. But when he offers his last breath and the earth eclipses, he turns his back because even God can't stand to see his son dying on the cross. Have I got any help in here? He gave him to save us. And in the ugliness of humanity, with all God knows about him, he never tries to take him back. He still gives him. Y'all looking at me funny. The last lesson is that God is always present in every stage of life. Are y'all hearing me? Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. There are numerous instances in scripture where Jesus performed miracles and he's healing the sick and raising the dead. He teaches with authority. Are y'all helping me here? All of these are manifestations of his power but they're also clear demonstrations of God's presence. Are y'all helping me here? That God is involved in the ministry of Jesus. And, and in all that God is present in, in this critical moment, when the enactment of righteousness is happening in this critical moment, when lives are hanging in the balance, God is right there. Y'all ain't helping me preach. When he takes his lap, God is right there. Now, that helps you because if he was there for Jesus, nudge your neighbor and say, he'll be there for you. In the enactment of your life's critical moments, God doesn't go missing. He's right there. Come on, y'all. He, he's not there necessarily to stop what's happening. He's there for you to draw strength from his presence. Have I got any help in here? There, there are some things that he won't stop, but his presence helps you to get through it. And there is no argument about the fact that Jesus hanging on the cross casts his view into heaven, into the face of his father and what sustains him and helps him to get through it as a human dying on the cross is that he's able to discern that his father is with him. I don't know who I'm preaching to. The reason why you can go through some stuff and don't lose your mind. The reason why you haven't given up on life with all of the stuff you've been through. And might I add, parenthetically, there's some folk in here who's been through some stuff. Life for you ain't been no crystal stairway. There's some folk in here who has some challenges with family and life and, and health and career and you name it because it's a full spectrum of things. But what helped you to get through it is that you saw the face of God. He didn't pull you out, but he told you I'm right here with you. Nudge your neighbor and say that's why we celebrate him. He did not always pull us out, but he does see us through. I don't know who I'm preaching to, somebody in here. You can count on the fact that he's going to be right there to see you through it. Ooh, I got to stop. Who killed Jesus? Who 
kill Jesus. Wait a minute. We named three groups. The people. Jewish leaders. The soldiers. But who killed him? Okay, we, we, we'll leave, but we got to leave with this. If we're going to talk about Jesus dying on the cross, we're going to have to include his willingness to die. I want to, James, I'm trying to argue the text, but when I look at John 10, 17 through 18, Jesus says, the Father loves me because I, I'm willing to give my life. I, I ain't going to even read it. I'll just help you. He says, no man takes my life. <laughs> I, got the, I got the power to lay it down. And then, better row, I got the power to pick it back up again. Have I got any help in here? He is our lamb, but wait a minute. As we are searching for whose guilt is Steve, we got to understand he is our lamb, but he is not overwhelmed by his captors. Have I got any help in here? Because while it might look like he is a victim, he has the power. They didn't take my life. I went with them by my own volition. Have I got any help in here? They may have been holding me, but I was walking with them. In fact, there's a point in which I'm leading them through the Via Della Rosa because I understand that the call on my life is to get to Calvary. And so it looks like the human participation is responsible. But the truth is, I lay down my own life. Because if I didn't want to, I could just blink. And legions of angels would come to my defense. But, but I don't need heaven's army because I decided when I took a junket from heaven and stepped on planet earth that I would give my life to fulfill the father's request. And that is that he and humanity come back into fellowship. Let me quit. Let me quit. Who killed Jesus? I'll finish this another time, but I'll give you this last piece. Who, who killed Jesus? It, it was Jewish authorities. Soldiers, Pilate, they're participants. But they ain't solely responsible. I, I want to offer you this last group because the Lord ain't going to let me leave until I give you this last group. Vera, I think humanity is responsible for putting him on the cross. Woo, Lord have mercy. Even David proves me right. He gets to the 51st Psalm and he says, Dr. Linda, I, I, was, I was shaping in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. When I came to planet Earth, I was already in sin. So humanity put him on the cross. Okay, you're looking at me funny. The, the question is, watch this. Why is humanity being punished for the sins of Adam and Eve? Okay, I got you. That's a good question. It's a good question, but here's the answer. See, we're the descendants of Adam and Eve. And while we were not alive when they were deceived and victimized by Satan, but, 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 watch this, their sin, somebody shout their sin, created an opening, a pattern of selfishness and willfulness. It was a misinterpretation of free will because Adam didn't have to become free by the eating of fruit from a forbidden tree. Man was created with liberty. But when Adam and Eve succumbed to the deceit of Satan, it created a system of lawlessness. Until then, man had only one thing to avoid, and those were trees. 
but their curiosity sparked by the enticing words of Satan caused Adam to fall. And for centuries, what has, what and who deceived Adam and Eve has deceived us and caused us to sin. That's why humanity passed Adam and Eve and humanity present, those who were living when Christ was dying and humanity future, those who were yet unborn, Christ died for all three. Is that, Lord have mercy, that in his dying, he reaches back and releases Adam and Eve and then comes back present and releases all who are guilty and then reaches into the future before you and I are born and says, when you get to sin, you'll discover I've already paid for it. Father, Father, forgive them. They think they killed me. They think they took my life. I gave my life. Forgive them for ignoring the requirement. Forgive them for choosing humanity over spirituality. Forgive them. They don't know what this will cost them. And God the Father honors the request of God the Son. I'm stopping. The grass will wither. Flowers will fade. Father. 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 He's on the cross. He's not whispering. He's shouting, Father! Forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Father, in this place, would you forgive us for living like we've not been redeemed? That when we continue in sin, it's like we're trying to keep him on the cross. But help us to know that our sin debt has already been paid. It's, the debt has been wiped out. And because of that, we can live free from sin. I pray for somebody in this room whose heart is heavy. and Whose life is overladen with guilt. Help them to know that they've been set free by the blood of the crucified lamb. And because of that, they can live now as sons and daughters. We love you and we appreciate your gift. And we acknowledge scripture, every good gift, every perfect gift comes from above. And we bless your name for the gift of Jesus on Calvary. Somebody who will stand in agreement. Shout hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, give him praise. And the people of God said amen. On a hill, far away, stood an old rugged cross. The emblem of suffering and shame but I love that old cross where the dearest and best for a world of lost sinners was slain so I cherish the old rugged cross My trophies till my troll at last I lay down lay down when I don't know what else to do I will cling I will cling to the old rugged cross to the old rugged cross what will you do I'll exchange it 
someday day for a for crown. crown. Sing it. Ooh, on a hill far away stood an old the door of my father's house is open rugged cross the emblem of suffering and shame and I love that old cross where the dearest where the dearest Best for a world of lost sinners was slain. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my till my trophy. of the cross still saves the power of the cross still redeems us the image of the cross still heals us the very visibility of the cross still empowers us if we lose everything else we have as long as we have the cross we're still gonna make it. We're reaching to you. You're in that purple chair, you're watching online. And you're trying to make a decision about the rest of your life. Let me just tell you very quickly, if Jesus is not your savior and Lord, not only do you not know where you'll spend eternity, but you'll live a very defeated life. And so my word to you this morning, not to try and perfect yourself you don't know how but to give yourself to the Lord and let him do the cleansing work if you're in these chairs nobody's gonna condemn you for what you said or done or how you live that ain't our business but what we seek to do is to get you to a forgiving Jesus he died on the cross so that your sins could be washed away and all our message is is that he loves you and that love is enough for everything that shows up in your life if you're hearing my voice and you're in these seats in fact you ought to ask somebody you're sitting beside if they're saved it ain't just about being a member of new life i'm after salvation you're watching me on online are you saved do you know beyond the shadow of a doubt that you are saved but if you know you're saved you're in right standing but if you're not sure there's some prompts on the screen that will get you to us so that we can help you to get to a place of certainty 